all so much for being here. Um, this is great turnout. Last year when we did the first of these, we had icy sidewalks and snow all over the place, and it was a miracle it happened. This year we got snowed out for our original plan, and so um, I'm really grateful that the weather cooperated and that we could all be here today for this gathering. And I want you all to join me in giving special thanks to Marilyn Castriota, who is the Center for Academic Innovations coordinator and who helped me to organize this and then to reorganize it in the face of a snow closure. So Marilyn, thank you so much. A very special thanks too to the four faculty innovators that you all are going to hear from today. And you've got the program in front of you so you know what the lineup is. But um, these are the people at this institution, uh, among many of us, who really advance the impact of our purpose, which is to provide transformative education through scholarship, innovation, and community action for a just and sustainable society. And I'm really excited to hear about what they're going to share with us today. So um, I was thinking about sort of the top three reasons why, why we're here why we are part of this powerful learning community. And the three things that came to mind for me, and I, I wonder if these resonate for you as well, are because we're committed to winning victories for humanity, first and foremost, and because we care about educating our students to become effective change leaders, and because we enjoy the collegiality of swimming, sometimes upstream, admittedly, with people whom we really like and who feed our energy to go out and build a just and sustainable society. I know that's why I'm here, and I suspect that that's what brought many of you into this learning community. I made a transition here a couple years ago, coming into this role with uh, the newly created Center for Academic Innovation. Uh, and I came into that role with an understanding that the focus of the work was going to be to jumpstart a new wave of innovation at this institution that would be fundamental to Antioch New England's financial and thought leadership sustainability. And um, as I took that challenge on, I kept going back again and again to this purpose statement that guides all of us and really being um, inspired by it and also recognizing that innovation is an explicit part of why we exist as a higher ed institution. So it's not only core to our purpose, but I would argue that innovation is actually essential to our continuation as a renewable resource. And maybe um, the use of that term renewable resource surprises some people in the room Jim Gruber, what's, what do you think of when you think of a renewable resource? Oh, I would say systems that meet the criteria of cradle to cradle. Keep going around. Models mm -hmm. need to go out system. Yes. OK, anyone else? What's a renewable resource? What comes to mind for you when you think about a renewable resource? Snow. Snow. <laughs> Curses. Snow, that's right, water, the water cycle, right? The water cycle is a renewable resource. What else is a Wood renewable? Paper. Wood, I was hoping I'd get that. All right, anything else that comes to mind? Soil. Soil, yep, that's great. John Crockett. Something that has to die in order to be reborn. Ooh, ooh, that's challenging. <laughs> Hopefully, we're not going to have to die in order to be reborn. Um, but you got the idea. I mean, we're mostly, most of us think about natural capital when we think about what renewable resources are. We think about water, wood, wind. You get the picture. And what I'm suggesting to you is that we think about this institution of Antioch University, New England, as a renewable resource. And it's a renewable resource that um, requires stewardship and it requires adaptation so that it continues to be there for our students, our faculty, our staff, the alumni that we send out into the world, the communities all over the place, all over this planet that we serve. And so um, I'm suggesting that we, we sort of 
train ourselves to think about this place as a renewable resource and to think about what it's going to take to strengthen that resource and keep it sustainable. So thinking about the Center for Academic Innovation, um, how do we, as a part of this institution, contribute to leadership for sustainability and innovation? The center focuses um, on facilitating all sorts of interesting new ideas that um, people in this learning community and people outside this learning community come to us with. What we provide is financial, organizational, and consulting support. And so I would like for you to take a minute to look at this handout that you all have on your table. These are just some examples of innovation initiatives that have been supported over the course of the last year or so by the Center for Academic Innovation. And um, that should give you some sense of what, what we've been spending our time focused on. Um, we are enablers in the best sense of that word. And so taking a page from a newly emerging theory called complexity leadership theory, what we do is to provide that function of enabling leadership that protects the conditions in which adaptive leadership can flourish and that allows for emerging innovations. So if you have an innovation idea, please come talk to us. Marilyn and I would love to have a conversation with you if you have an idea about something you want to do. Um, those of you who were here last year probably remember this slide. Um, this is Peter F. Drucker, who those in the management world worship as a guru. And um, he wrote this book, Innovation and Entrepreneurship. It was published back in 1985. He considered it to be the seminal work on innovation and entrepreneurship. He was a very modest person. And, um, and in writing about uh, innovation and entrepreneurship, um, he offered this statement. So here's an innovation trivia question. I want you to complete this sentence. Drucker asserted that, quote, no better text for a history of entrepreneurship could be found than the creation and development of blank. Any guesses? Any after university. Oh, Steve Chase. That was so great. Yes, the modern university, and especially the modern American university. So, um, so Drucker pointed to higher ed institutions in this country as being the, at the forefront of innovation and entrepreneurship. And yes, we find ourselves in really great company in that sense. So he termed innovation and entrepreneurship as actually being part of the executive's job as a duty of institutional leadership. And this event today um, is very much based on the understanding that um, organizations, if they want to foster innovation and remain sustainable, need to build systems of entrepreneurial management and organizational learning to support innovation. So 25 years later, along come Ehring and Christensen, and they put out this book a few years ago called The Innovative University. And in this book, they compared the university to a living organism whose identity is reflected in its every cell. And they cautioned that a university cannot be made more efficient by simply cutting its operating budget any more than a carnivore can be converted to an herbivore by constraining its intake of meat. So to be successful at innovating, they say that universities have to recognize and honor their strengths while innovating with optimism. And I think all the people you're going to hear from today definitely fall into the innovators with optimism category. Um, rather than seeking to imitate others' success, universities must be true to their own particular DNA and define themselves in individual terms rather than emulating others. So that's all good, right? Um, but we also know that sometimes it takes a little fertilizer to support the growth of new things. And so part of what the Center for Academic Innovation has been doing over the last 20 months or so is mobilizing external resources. And these are some of the, the sources um, of support that innovators in this community have been successful in reaching out to and leveraging uh, external dollars from. 
And uh, we also have been giving out these innovation grants. We've done four waves of innovation grant funding over the last 20 months. Um, roughly $50,000 has been dispersed, and there's been a five to one return on that modest investment because that 50,000 has translated into more than $250,000 coming back into this institution to support innovation initiatives here. So that's um, one metric that I wanted to share with you. Um, for those of you who know that we have a five-year campus strategic plan, that actually called for us to achieve $250,000 worth of external support by the year 2016-17 to support innovation here. So we're a little bit ahead of schedule because we've already hit that mark, and that's great, and that's just the beginning. So the other thing that um, the... Uh, the campus strategic plan calls on us to do is to engage strategic partners. And I suspect that you're gonna to hear today from our innovators about some really interesting external strategic partnerships that have grown out of these relationships. And um, these are just some, some of those, those interesting uh, partnerships that have arisen. So I'm gonna wrap up by showing you this slide, which if you ever get emails from me, you know is my avatar. And um, this is the tame and gentle version of Blue Ocean Strategy. And Blue Ocean Strategy is a particular way of thinking about innovation in which you make the competition irrelevant because the competition doesn't exist. You've created new demand. You've created new market space. You've gone out into the world and you've created things that just don't exist in any other form. And today you're going to be hearing from people who are doing exactly that. They're jumping out of a very crowded tank into fresh blue ocean and swimming forward. <laughs>